So welcome everybody to the workshop of uh, on goals and principles of representation learning. And I just wanted to say that it's um, pretty big privilege to be organizing a workshop here. This is my second DALI and I was blown away by the first DALI, how high quality the audience was and how the information density of the conversations I had here is significantly higher than any other meeting and this is my favorite conference so being able to organize a workshop and divert the attention of all of these smart people onto a topic of, of our choice is, is a pretty big um, privilege and responsibility. And one thing that I uh, hope to do, even though like hopefully this is not the full audience of this entire workshop, is to encourage everybody to be conversational and to ask questions and to, um, to discuss things. And maybe um, you're all sort of forward, but if you kind of want to come more forward so we can have more discussions and ask questions easier, that would be great. Um, so to summarize the scope of the workshop, I have, I have these, uh, these two things. Uh, there is a challenge which we perceive as a challenge that we lack clarity around the goals of unsupervised representation learning. Representation learning has been a big thing, especially with deep learning recently, um, and a lot of people develop various methods for unsupervised representation learning, not just recently, but over the last couple of decades. Um, but I think we are now at a point where there are more algorithms um, than, than there are sort of clear principles guiding uh, how we should understand and how we should design new algorithms in this space. And this lack of clarity extends to many different levels. It is often not specified what task we are trying to solve with unsupervised learning. And it is often unclear whether the principles we use to learn representations in an unsupervised way are appropriate for solving those tasks in the first place. So what we are hoping is that this workshop provides a forum for discussing this question. Um, many of the presenters are going to bring their own views on this topic and hopefully in the discussion session at the, at the end of the workshop we are going to have, uh, we are going to start making progress towards um, getting more clarity on this idea. One of the challenges we have is that uh, there is a competing workshop, uh, competing for an overlapping audience, the theory of deep learning workshop. Uh, the way I would characterize the main differences is that the theory of deep learning workshop asks, uh, deep learning works unreasonably well, let's try to understand why it works so well. Whereas our workshop says, deep learning works well, what exactly should we make it do? And particularly in the context of unsupervised representation learning. And I want to add here that um, we are thinking about the goals and principles. We don't even care if it's deep learning or not, which uh, kind of achieves those goals. Um, so we are not necessarily a deep learning workshop here. Another way to, to uh, scope this workshop is by ref referencing Moore's three levels of analysis. And this was originally proposed in the context of uh, neuroscience and cognition, how to understand cognition at these three different levels. Uh, you can understand at the highest level, at the level of goals, which is the computational level. What is the goal of the system? How can we formulate an objective that measures our progress towards that goal? The algorithmic level talks about what would be a good algorithm for achieving that goal. And the implementational level asks how, do, how can we actually implement that algorithm, either in the brain uh, or in the case of machine learning in, in a, on a computer. And so again, if we try to compare the two, workshops going on in parallel here, and there's also the healthcare one. Uh, we are trying to focus on the topmost level, the computational level. What is the goal? What, what are the principles and what are the objective functions we should be caring about? And the other workshop is probably thinking more about the algorithmic level, which is why is it that the stochastic gradient descent algorithm with deep learning is such a good algorithm to solve many of the well understood goals like classification. I think we have a, a pretty amazing speaker lineup, and I've put uh, uh, pictures up here in the order in which the speakers appear, by no means in the order of importance. Hari is going to start, uh, and I really like Hari's work. Uh, personally, I think he's a very nonconformist, hipster kind of researcher that <laughs> does a lot of uh, uh, things differently from, from mainstream, uh, mainstream research, and I think that that is, uh, is very good in this context of trying to 
bring different perspectives. Uh, but the rest of the speakers are equally um, interesting. We're going to have opinions about uh, transfer learning. Cedric and probably Olivier is going to talk about that. Um, opinions about uh, semi-supervised learning. Yasha is going to give a talk. Uh, opinions on disentanglement. Irina is, is going to be uh, hopefully giving us her thoughts on that. Um, Matthias gives us the neuroscientist view on representation learning and what we can uh, maybe learn from that. And then finally, Marta is going to talk about the importance of symbolic representations, um, which might, and how do you combine that with, uh, with, with deep representations or, or, uh, or that sort of thing. So um, I don't want to say that our speaker lineup is better than the other workshop. I did not say that. Uh, but, I, but I think it is a very high bar to meet. Um, the organizers, um, Shakir um, has given the keynote yesterday, so um, everybody probably knows who he is anyway. Um, and then Andri is also from DeepMind, and then my colleague from Lucas. We've all done uh, some work in the, um, in the area of representation learning, and I think we also have kind of a, a Bayesian upbringing, although I often describe myself as a rehabilitated Bayesian these days. Um, so. I think that um, the speakers, together with uh, this audience in this room, uh, is really um, capable of, of uh, driving a very important discussion in this space. So in the remaining, I don't know, probably 10 minutes, uh, I wanted to give an overview of what I meant by the lack of clarity around uh, unsupervised representation learning and why I think um, you know, what are the, the certain things that emerged and, and just give an overview of all the different ideas that are out there. One of the most compelling reasons why we want to, to do unsupervised learning is in the context of transfer learning, where the goal of learning a representation in an unsupervised fashion is that you can later transfer that representation to another task that you actually care about, like classification or reinforcement learning, decision making, and so on. The problem is that if you set it up in a fully unsupervised fashion, the question is, what future task do we actually want to solve? And, uh, and that, you know, that is sort of the main question. If you, if you do representation learning in an unsupervised way for transfer learning, without knowing what you want to transfer it to, can you still use it? Uh, can you still uh, de derive interesting guiding principles that work for any future task or, the fu the, or a set of future tasks that you might encounter in the future? Um, Semi-supervised learning provides uh, a very interesting view on this because there you have a little bit of insight into what is the supervised part of the problem that you want to solve um, and that can provide constraints on the unsupervised part. I think Yasha is going to talk about mainly, mainly this idea. Um, another uh, actual application of unsupervised representation learning is, is lossy compression. You can use um, the, the sort of task requires that you have a representation that can be stored in a compact way and uh, at the same time the data, the original data should be able to, you should be able to reconstruct uh, the data from uh, the representation that you store. And in this particular task, grid distortion theory provides an objective uh, that one can actually sort of turn into a minimizable um, objective function and, and meaningful algorithms. There has been a lot of work recently on, on, on this application. You might also want to use unsupervised representation learning to sort of convert between different types of representation. For example, the original data might be difficult to deal with for whatever reasons. Uh, so maybe you're dealing with nodes in a graph or uh, a set of things or collection of things, or you might have varying um, size uh, per data point, and this is not very comfortable to, to work with. So you might want to turn that into a, a vector representation. And this is kind of what's going on in, in work to back, for example, or uh, graph embeddings. Uh, an example that um, there is something that I, I work with uh, these days is trying to represent the user's behavior in an online system. A user has a lot of different logs and activities and a lot of different uh, tweets, for example, they might be reading. And how do you take all of that data, which is a, a big, you know, a lot of 
lists of sets of things into something that is a compact representation that is about the same size for each user uh, that now you can much more easily use in your, in your, um, in your machine learning methods. So these are sort of the tasks that I could come up with, um, which I think are meaningful tasks or potential tasks for unsupervised representation learning. I'm pretty sure there are many more. Um, and now I'm sort of uh, going more into the, the different principles that people have proposed. Disentanglement is an interesting one because it's kind of unclear whether we consider disentanglement a task, like we want to do disentanglement for the sake of interpreting the data or whether it's a principle that we can use to guide, say, transfer learning. So that's one of the discussion points that uh, I'm hoping to learn more about today. Um, it is also kind of a fuzzy definition of what exactly disentangle me disentanglement means, especially in an unsupervised um, context. This is one definition that is going around, which is a change in one dimension, direct, uh, change in, one dimension in the representation corresponds to a change in one factor of variation. But of course, this just pushes the complexity of definition into what is a factor of variation exactly. There are various ways to demonstrate or measure disentanglement. Um, you can look at independence. People have done that in the past. You can look at interpolation of in, in feature space and see what sort of things you, um, you know, in, in image data, for example, you can, a human can look at it and see how interpretable those interpolation paths are. Um, another big thing is analogical reasoning with features. Um, that we might want to use directly. Everybody, I think, is probably familiar with this uh, property of word to vec where if you take the embedding of Rome, you subtract the embedding of Italy and add the embedding of France, you get roughly the embedding of Paris. Uh, the question is, is there a principled way to measure this, uh, this, um, disentanglement? and in a way which is independent of the application or the domain that you're looking at. And I'm hoping that people are gonna tell me that I'm just not aware of a, of a very good uh, way of measuring this. Uh, but to me, this seems like a little bit of a, a fuzzy area. A lot of people use the likelihood and maximum likelihood learning uh, to, to train latent variable models. Um, so um, for the purposes of these slides, I say a latent variable model is a joint distribution over the observable data X and some representation Z. So Z is the representation, X is the original data. So if you think about what does it mean to reason about the usefulness of representation, you're probably reasoning about uh, the property of the conditional of the representation given, given X. Um, at the same time, if you think about what the, the model likelihood actually measures, it measures the usefulness of P of X, or it measures how P of X actually fits to the data. And so if you actually um, kind of put that on a, on a, on a, on a figure, uh, on the X axis we have the likelihood which maximum likelihood would measure, on the Y axis we have the usefulness of this, um, of this representation P of Z given, given X, you can see that the objective function doesn't actually measure usefulness. It's kind of measures an orthogonal property of the latent variable model. So when things get really interesting is when you actually restrict the model class. So here I assume that all possible latent variable models are, can be implemented by our model class. And um, if you actually restrict that to a smaller class Q, then you might find that minimizing likelihood actually leads to a good representation. But it's kind of by accident. And if you choose a different uh, set, a different uh, set of models, it might have the property that actually minimizing likelihood does not lead to a good representation at all. And uh, Lucas and, and Matthias have worked on a paper um, in, the, in the context of generative modeling, which talks about this uh, in a, and gives a pr practical example of how these two things might not um, necessarily be. Um, sort of good likelihood does not necessarily mean good representation, vice versa. So the quality of representation with maximum likelihood depends on the model class, and this makes it very hard to understand whether and how exactly likelihood leads to good representations. Um, and and, uh, and another thought is that variational inference might actually give you useful um, constraints on the representation itself. And uh, finally, mutual information has been 
used in various shapes or forms, both in supervised and unsupervised learning. The interesting thing that I find very puzzling here is that if you look at a supervised setting, you have the information bottleneck approach, which says uh, a rep good representation minimizes information with the inputs and maximizes mutual information with the outputs. And there's been some recent uh, observations that stochastic gradient descent might actually do that naturally in neural networks. And that's a very interesting piece of work that unfortunately we don't have a speaker covering at this, this workshop. Yet when you look at how information is used in the unsupervised setting, um, you almost always see that we seek to maximize mutual information with the inputs. So there is somehow a, a disconnect between how we use information in the supervised setting and how it's used in the unsupervised setting. Uh, there are many different algorithms that can be interpreted as, as variants of information maximization. So uh, GANs are this classical method from 2014. Um, there was a very good workshop at this uh, at DALI last year. It's, um, let me just say, and we through these slides, um, it is very unclear how and even if GANs are useful for representation learning. Nevertheless, you will find a ton of papers that uh, look at the representation learned by GANs. And it's not even clear if you want the generator to be the representation or the discriminator to be the representation or something completely different like an inference network as it's done in, in, in InfoGANs. Um, and actually the idea for this workshop came from last year's Theory of GANs workshop where this question came up in the final discussion session. Like what is it that GANs are actually useful for or should we use them for representation learning for example? And it's, I, I still don't have an answer to that. Uh, the answer might just simply be probably not. We have no speakers about GANs, which is also something that we may be uh, sort of proud of, that we are kind of over that period in time now. Uh, to get a, I, I, hope, I, I hope nobody actually has slides on, on GANs because then I'm in trouble. So just to summarize, we're, we're asking these sorts of questions. What is the task that we solve? Um, if we have chosen a task, what are the guiding principles that can lead, us, uh, lead to a good solution? And then how can we turn those principles into objective functions? And my kind of dream outcome, not just of this workshop, but of the, the community's thinking, is that um, we are going to be able to design algorithms for unsupervised representation learning, starting from the task, and then step by step, kind of moving down in this um, three layers of, of uh, Mars, three layers of, uh, of understanding. Um, and we are focusing on the first part of this, which is what is the task? Is the principle we are using actually useful for that task? Is the objective function that we use actually consistent with the principles? And so on. Uh, so I'm hoping that I'm going to walk away from this and everybody's going to walk away from this workshop being a little bit smarter about what the connection between all of these things are. And with that, I will uh, hand it over to Harry, who's actually going to give um, the interesting first talk of, uh, of this workshop. <laughs>